The CASA info is up on Quercus now. So if you go to Quercus, if you just scroll all the way down to the homepage, there's uh, a Facebook group for CASA. There's uh, their uh, group for this specific class. And there's also uh, info on their office hours. So their office hours are three to six on Mondays. And it's pure like drop in. They don't have like a plan for you. It's just some very nice people sitting in a room waiting for you specifically from this class to come drop in and talk to them about cognitive science. And you can go in with something as vague as I feel lost and I, I want emotional support. They'll help you with that. Uh, you can go in with something as specific as I'm thinking about such and such for a topic for my essay. Is that a good topic? They'll be able to advise you about that. Or I'm curious about the cognitive science program at U of T in general and what kind of job I can get and how hard it is to get through the program and questions like that. They would be happy to talk to you about that kind of thing as well. So please do drop in. They're, they're wonderful people and they're, they got a lot of resources for you, a lot of helpful resources for you. Um, so far nobody has, it's been two weeks so far, nobody has asked to come to my office hours. Uh, again, just any time that you feel like talking to me after class, uh, you're welcome to just hang out in this room and talk and or we can go to my office and talk there. So just a reminder, if you want to come to my office hours, you are absolutely welcome. Just let me know. Okay. Any other kind of course business stuff before we dive in? Everybody pretty good? I'm currently working on, I'm going to post as soon as I can the topics for the first essay. I'm currently working on them. I'd like to give you something reasonably specific. It would be fairly straightforward for me to just say, write me an essay on categorization, memory, or problem solving, but that kind of leaves more of the burden of framing it on you. So I'm trying to frame some more specific questions for you right now because that'll get you warmed up, take some of the intellectual burden off of you for the first essay, and leave it all for the second essay where you're coming up with the topic. So you're for your final, just a reminder, for your final essay in this course, you're going to be self-generating the topics. And they're going to be more in the, the first one is more of a psychology essay, second one's more of a philosophy essay. Uh, if you haven't read any psychology, the best preparation I can recommend for you would be to do the readings from this class, which are psych papers. So get used to reading psychology papers, get used to the format and the jargon and that kind of thing. So that's what I would recommend in terms of getting prepared. The first essay is not due until what, like July or something. It's, it's certainly not due before the first test. So that's not the first thing you have to worry about, but it is worth getting, getting the gears turning uh, in advance of that. Okay, any questions about that stuff? Good, okay, so we'll do a quick review and get into some new stuff. So recall last time we looked at a couple of theories of categorization. We're still in categorization. We're gonna finish off categorization today. And tomorrow we'll move on, or sorry, on uh, next week we'll move on to memory and problem solving. We looked at two theories of categorization, the classical theory of concepts with uh, this guy here, Aristotle, as kind of the main guy from that, uh, who, the, the person who's most famously associated with it, at least. He said that concepts are a kind of mental definition. So you've got in your head a set of necessary and sufficient conditions for any thing. Uh, and if, you, if it meets those necessary conditions, that it has all of the necessary conditions, that's sufficient for it to be that thing. And if it doesn't, then it's not that thing. Uh, we saw some nice advantages of this. For example, this gives us compositionality. So the concept is made out of little Lego blocks. And if you want to combine concepts, he's got a really nice story about how you do that. You take the parts of those concepts and you put them together in some meaningful way. That's really nice. That explains how we combine concepts together. It also explains this rather remarkable fact about us that we have, uh, we have productivity, that productivity of being able to put together any infinitely complex set of concepts into a sentence, right? You have a sentence saying something true or false about the world, and you can produce an infinite number of those. That's a capacity that we clearly have. So any complete story about concepts should tell us how that works. That would be nice. And Aristotle's classical theory of concepts does that for us. So good. Uh, of course, we also saw some problems for the classical theory, mostly that this just doesn't seem to be how necessary and sufficient conditions just doesn't seem to be how most of our concepts work. Most of our concepts outside of formal languages, formal reasoning systems like geometry, math, logic, computer programming, 
There, the classical theory of concepts works beautifully. Everywhere else, and for, I think for most of us, everywhere else is much larger than those formal languages. This theory just does not capture how our concepts work. So all of you are perfectly able to use the concept game. You're able to identify things that are games and things that are not games. However, we tried and failed, like many intro philosophy classes have in, in, in the past, to come up with a set of necessary conditions for what a game is. And it's not just games, it's practically every concept that you work with that don't have real crisp definitions. Yeah? We, we kind of like bash the idea of like a worm not being intelligent, but like it can make the categorization of like is food or not food. It's, it's, it's very stupid with respect to that like due to the limitations of our brain, is there like really an infinite way that we can categorize or describe them? Um, so productivity, so our, this is on the notion of productivity. So. Can, is, are, is there any reason to think that we have an infinite number of things that we can do? Or yeah. yeah, so the usual argument for this is just to look at conjunctions. So, or like counting. So I have the concept of one apple. I can have the concept of two apples and three and four. And there's no, it's not that I could hold an infinitely not large natural number in my head. It's just that there's no stopping point in which I can conceive of number of apples going up and up and up and up. Uh, there seems to be, of course there's biological limits to how long a sentence you could hold in your mind, but it's not a conceptual, it's not that your conceptual apparatus fails, it's that your working memory or your long-term memory or your, your voice would give out if you tried to say it or something like that. So you hit other biological limits much, much sooner than you hit the limits of your conceptual apparatus. That's, that's the argument. Uh, you can produce infinitely long sentences, like infinite number of true sentences. Say, I am not a frog, and I am not, not, not a frog, and I am not, not, not. And you can just, you can just add uh, uh, negations, or you could add disjunctions. So I am not a frog, and I am not a pig, and I am not a crow. So you can, you can produce... They're not interesting sentences, but there seems to be a number of ways in which you can produce just indefinitely large. Let's call it not infinite, but like unlimited, except for the biological limits of our ability to like say, say very long. Like eventually you just die of old age before you could say all the sentences. You would die, maybe the point is, you'd die of old age before you could say all the sentences that you could say. And there seems to be no problem for you to, especially when we're thinking about compositionality, uh, there's no, it's not that there's zero limits on the concepts you can put together, but there's this marvelous and hugely impressive capacity to put concepts together and get new concepts. So, uh, is, it, is it not maddening that we're starting from that massive, huge quantity than rather from the little worm that you kind of understand two concepts? <laughs> um, yes, yes. So it's much, much harder to explain our compositionality than it is to explain what a worm does. Um, how, how, how does this also extend to like self-referential concepts? Like you were saying, like telling a lie, I'm a liar and everything I say is a lie, but my last statement is true. Is that like an unconceptual idea of paradox, but we don't exactly understand why. We don't understand why what? Why that doesn't work? Why that makes us nervous, for instance? <laughs> I, think I, I think I could give you an ad hoc explanation. So you could say something like, we like for sentences to be true or false. Yes. We, we, we much prefer for something to either be completely true or completely false. It's easy to process. It's easy to think about. So when you get a sentence like, this sentence is false, it doesn't do that for us. And you get a little, Ugh, I don't really like that. Um, so. Yeah, yeah. So saying, so the claim of compositionality is not that there are no limits on your ability to conceptualize. This is a good clarification. It's not that, the claim is not that you can, there's no limits whatsoever, because like just with like the natural numbers, like the natural numbers are infinite, but that's not to say that everything in the universe is included in the natural numbers. Like, like fractions aren't con included in the natural numbers. So it's, it's not that there's everything in that series, it's just that the series goes on and on. So we'll talk a little bit when we get to philosophy of mind about the possibility that there are some things that we just can't 
understand. So there's, there's serious philosophers who argue that there are just limits to human minds and maybe things like explaining how consciousness works are simply beyond those limits. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll take that th the thesis quite seriously in the philosophy of mind section. Good. Follow-ups on this? Okay. So back to uh, problems for the classical theory. We talked about how the broad consensus is, and I don't think I offered you a super tight argument that there's no necessary and sufficient conditions for games. The argument is basically empirical, that nobody's been able to come up with a satisfying list. Uh, so, and then the question is, if, you, if you're convinced that there are necessary and sufficient conditions for something like game, the question is, why are you convinced of that? What's your, what's your argument for there being such a thing, given that nobody's been able, given that huge numbers of people competent in the language who know how to use the word game have nonetheless been unable to produce it? So that's, that's the argument against the class, the, the central argument against the classical theory. We looked at one or, the, one or two others. Uh, here's another one, specifically the failure of transitivity. So classical theory says stuff like, if you understand the definition of dog, you understand that that definition includes that it's a mammal, and the definition of mammal includes that it's a living thing. So you should very easily be able to do all dogs are living things. That should, be, that should be conceptually transparent to you. It should be easy. It should be straightforward. But then you ask these questions like, are char car seats chairs? Yes. Are car chairs a kind of furniture? Yes. Are car seats furniture? Ugh. Sort of, not really, right? And just the fact that anybody, so if, if you're perfectly fine with car seats being furniture, that's okay. The fact is that not everybody is. People, people are much less confident about this than all dogs are living things. So it looks like the, the, the transitivity at least sometimes fails and the classical theory says it should never fail. So that's where we were with that. So classical theory of concepts, probably not gonna do the job for us. So we moved on to the prototype theory. This is a, proto this is a theory uh, motivated by looking at philosophy, looking at the work of Ludwig Wittgenstein against the classical theory. And it says, yeah, theories don't have crisp edges. What they have is a prototypical core, a set of features weighted by their relevance that says what are the most common things that the category has. Dogs are fuzzy. Or like, so the, pr the prototype for cat has, they have fur and four legs and a tail and a terrible attitude towards life. And if you have a cat with no fur, you can have cats with no fur. There are those very weird gremlin looking hairless cats. You can have a cat with less than four legs. They often lose legs, it's still a cat. You can have a cat that's with a sweet disposition. I know there exists at least some of those, right? So that doesn't disqualify it from being a cat. What the prototype theory tells us is that you can have vague boundaries around your category, and the closer you are to the prototype, the more people say, ah, yeah, that's exactly what that is. Um, and that seemed to be borne out by some empirical evidence. For example, that people rate robins as more bird-like than penguins or emus or vultures, right? Those, are, those have less of the prototypical features of those, the category bird than the robin does, and that gives us this nice prototypical structure. People would investigate this by building those typicality gradients. So you'd ask people questions. How typical is this of a bird? And I'd give you a rating. And then you try to build the structure of the prototype by you know, reconstructing people's typicality gradients from their ratings. And we worried quite a bit about this as an empirical process. We worried about confounds. We worried about confounds like uh, how familiar, familiar you are with the thing rather than uh, asking like, are people just saying the things they're familiar with or are they saying the structure of their concepts? That's, a, I think, a, a legitimate worry here. Yeah? I don't think like a category of uh, something that's immaterial, like it has, or, or a prototype of something immaterial, like math, yeah. or, I don't know, uh, gravity, or something like that. Yeah. Like we, we are not able to usually perceive that, or even, you know, perceive math, but we can understand how, how do you, how does the prototype theory align That's fine for the prototype theory because it does, there's no explicit requirement in prototype theory that the features be perceptually perceivable features. 
So one of the features of the number three is that it's an odd number. Oddness is not a thing that you can see. Uh, but like one of the features of a cat is that it's a mammal. I don't really think that I can see mammalianness. I don't know what that looks like exactly. Yeah, but it's a sort of inference that you make that it's mammalian rather than something that's like con contrast, contrast being a mammal with being blue or being square. Like those are things that you're literally, you can see where that's happening in your eyeballs that you're picking up those features. Whereas lots of the features in prototypes are more abstract, more, uh, more kind of inferred than observed, that kind of thing. So there's no built-in requirement in prototype theory that the features that are being picked out are like directly perceptible features. Yeah? Good. And we saw some examples of that. Uh, so some problems for the prototype theory. How do we produce them in the first place? There's just no story given about that. Uh, but there was also this stuff about untip unstable typicality gradients. These typicality gradients that people are producing seem to change across contexts. Remember that stuff about a typical beverage for a secretary versus a typical beverage for a trucker. People give different answers despite presumably having the same beverage concept in both cases. Yeah? But aren't those different concepts like uh, well, a typical beverage for, I suppose those might be different concepts, but then the worry with that is, uh, that's one way of responding to that concern, but the, the worry with that is that there are an almost indefinite number of possible contexts, and what, if you ever get in a situation where you have to say, you've got an indefinite number of structures in your head, that's worrying, right? It's worrying when you need an infinitely long list of anything because we clearly have finite sized brains. So that was the, that was the concern with, if you want to say, look, look, I've got a different beverage concept for, like probably none of you had ever thought before about the question of what's a typical beverage for a trucker, right? Unless you've got truckers in your family or your close social circle, like it probably just never came up for you. But you were able to generate, I bet all of you were able to generate some guesses about that. You had some notions about that. And that's either something that the concept was able to produce for you, or you've got a unique concept that you just never needed before and you called it up. So if that's the case, then you got this like enormous, almost indefinitely long, like astronomically large store of concepts that you've never needed and never used, and you're, they're just waiting in the background for somebody to ask you, what's a typical beverage for an astronaut who's just built their first moon base? And you think, Tang. You know, like, why, why, did I, why did I have that concept somewhere in my head? And you can, you can give either answer. Like, if, if you think that you can get that list within a human brain, you could give that answer. Like, look, there's just separate, pro there's just separate prototypes for either of them. Or you could say, prototype theory has not given us enough, a complex enough picture of how concepts work to show how they could be context sensitive like this. So prototype theory tells us it's just a list. The prototype for beverage is just a list of common features of be that beverages have weighted by their relevance. And maybe that's not what concepts are. Maybe concepts are, have more internal structure than that. And that's a, that's a notion that we're gonna kind of deal with today. We're going to uh, deal with another theory of concepts that gives them a little more structure. So yeah. is the critique that it doesn't explain the productivity of the um, In this case, it's the, uh, I think productivity is a slightly different notion, but in this case, it's the context sensitivity of them. So your concepts behave differently in different contexts, and there's nothing in prototype theory that gives you the machinery for explaining how they do that. So you're, you're, it's, in, it's related to productivity, but it, that's, that's got a fairly technical definition, so we may, maybe don't want to use that word for it. Yeah, but you're, you're on the right track, but yeah. Yeah? Can you semantics of the word itself also affect the context of like how we see the rest of the scene in which we're kind of comparing the object to or we're viewing that? So if I, I talk about a person as a dog versus a dog, mm. like does that, like I, I clearly know that yeah, just you know, like the meanings that the features that are assigned to them are different. But does that is that an alteration of the concept, or is that at what point does it go from semantics to concept? Kind of when they uh, so I would have said that semantics are part of the so the semantics of a word are 
have to be captured by the, con the concept of the word. So my concept of d uh, pig is, it has to produce the semantics. The semantics are just like the meaning of the word, right? So the meaning of the, the word beverage has to be somehow encoded by my beverage concept, right? The meaning of the word not change in relation to the context or something? It does, it does. And that's, that's, that's a really important and interesting thing that humans do is that we use words in a context sensitive manner and unclear how to make that, how to represent that using prototype theory. Yeah, good. Okay, what else did we talk about? Oh yeah, we talked about the fa failure of compositionality, this big spoon, little spoon, metal spoon, wooden spoon thing. Uh, let me just give you one more example here, just maybe to make it clearer. So here's another one from Osherson and Smith that we didn't talk about last time, but it's the same idea. It's the same failure of compositionality. So what are the typical, ask people, what are the typical features of a pet? They say things like they're cute and fuzzy and cuddly and you like to touch them and they're, they're nice. You know, that's the, you know, you like them, you form a bond with them. What are the typical features of a fish? Well, they're scaly and grayish or pinkish or something like that. They live underwater. Now, what are the features of a pet fish? And all prototype theory gives us for conceptual combination is really just to either push those lists of features together or maybe pick a few of them out. So a pet fish is something that's fuzzy and scaly and you like to touch it and it lives underwater. Is that what a pet fish is? No, no. When you put pet and fish together, you get something new, right? They're usually brightly colored. You don't touch them. They don't know their names. They don't bond with you. They don't even make eye contact with you, right? Unlike all of the other pets, usually you have a, some kind of connection with them, something like that. So just, just smashing those lists together or maybe like taking one, you know, one feature here, one feature here, one feature here, one feature here, doesn't seem to explain how we get pet fish. Yeah? It's just that it's, there's just a more complex, what's going on here is there's just a more complex interaction between the concept pet and fish than a simple summation of the two concepts. That's the failure of compositionality. We're not given any story about how they get put together. Yeah. I've always considered pet fish more akin to like an arts display. An arts display, right, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Would that be due to the way I put together my uh, category of like art display? I don't know, I don't know how that happened in your head. Colorful. They are, yeah. They're meant for looking at. Yeah, yeah. They're in the main room. Yeah, basically. it's true. It's true. Um, I don't know how you came across that notion. It makes sense. It makes perfect sense. So pet fish is equal to moving, living, you know, installation piece or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so the point is just, it's really, it's really not clear according to prototype theory. They haven't given us a story, but how we do this thing, this really important and interesting thing of combining concepts in, together and getting a nonlinear combination of the two concepts. Yeah. I can just say like they're both animals. And, like it's still they can be nested with each other. Like they're both active. You know, they both interact with me. So like at one point it, it, it fails of like okay a fish if we get into the real nitty gritty feature details of it, it fails in comparison to the nitty gritty details of like a cat or a fuzzy pet. Yeah. But it still satisfies the requirement of compositionality if you go up the chain and more and more. Okay. Down. So if you if you get to the most abstract features, then yeah. But we don't want our theories to just succeed once in a while, we would like them to tell us the whole story about cognition, of course. Yeah? All right. Yeah? I feel like that still breaks down when you consider like pet rock. Pet rock, yeah. It's not fuzzy, it doesn't interact with you, it's not even attractive to look at, it's just a rock. Or a fish. Yeah, yeah. But there's something that's defining about like pet. It's like there has to be something fundamental to that. Like... I feel like you could just keep assigning weirder and weirder things the word pet to just cut off whatever you might try and claim is like the, the basic notion of pet. 
OK, let's, well, I'm sure there's a class at this university on the philosophy of pets. We could, we could do this all day. But let's, uh, let's keep going. Let's keep going. OK, so we have just one more thing to talk about in this quick review. Or, uh, two more things, sorry. We've got this stuff about uh, generating typicality gradients where there shouldn't be typicality gradients. So typicality gradients were supposed to be our, our tool for investigating the structure of concepts, the structure of prototypes. And if you ask people sensible questions like, what's the most typical vegetable, they'll give you sensible sounding answers. And people took this to be evidence that they were really probing the structure of concepts. And then when you ask them questions that aren't sensible, like what's the most typical odd number, is, is 7 or 57 the most typical, more typical odd numbers, they'll give you typicality gradients again, when they really shouldn't be, because we know the structure of the concept odd number. It's any number not evenly divisible by two, right? Like, that's what it is to be an odd number. There's no typicality gradient to be had there, yet people were producing them perfectly happily. So that casts some doubt. This, these weird typicality gradients cast some doubt on the ones that looked like they intuitively made sense. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, and that's, well, so typical of the category. And if what people are answering, if when, when, you, when you get a number for the typicality of the odd numbers, if what you get is just how often you see the number, that's sort of a familiarity effect. You're just like, that's how familiar I am with this instance of it. Then that tells you that what you're measuring when you've got these ill-defined categories probably isn't the structure of the concept. It's how long has it been since you saw a car? How long has it been since you've seen a boat? Yeah, so if what, you're, if what we're really measuring with these typicality gradients is just how familiar, how, how comfortable are you with these different instances, then it's not telling us about conceptual structure. It's telling us whether you live near cars or boats, right? Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, follow up and then, and then you, yeah. Well, but that's not, that's not a, so just like how long has it been since you saw something isn't enough to fill out a conceptual, like the, the, the concepts that we use, right? Like that's just a measure of like, you can, you can very simply measure how long it's been since you saw a car or a boat or skis or a horse, but that's not going to give you the concept of a vehicle. Right? You want your concepts to do much more than just tell you how long it's been since you saw a thing. So that's, that would be the word with that. Then, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that it's because they were asked how, how typical something is uh -huh. that they would come up with an answer. Yep. Because I don't think people normally use the consciously think about, oh, how typical is this number, how typical is this number. Sure, number. sure. But once they're asked, they're, they, that's, and, and if something in the defense of it's just a number, an even number, they'd be okay to come up coming up with an answer. Yep. I still think subconsciously we don't think about like, how typical no, sure, sure. So this is just an explanation for why people would be willing to do this. Yeah, just yeah. because they were asked to. Yeah, yeah. But that, again, that, that sheds doubt, that, le that leads doubt to this as a method of an understanding conceptual structure. If people just say stuff, like if, if you just, people will just say random numbers or like numbers that don't have much to do with the structure of the concept when, in, when put in this task. That tells you that the task is probably not ideal for measuring conceptual structure, which is what people thought they were doing. Yeah? People thought they were understanding the structure of our concepts by getting these typicality gradients. They thought that this was telling us how our concepts worked. And if you're producing just gobbledygook when on command, then that should make you worry about the methodology, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, could the problem be that like, typical is probably defined here? Could be, yeah. Yep. Like if you really yep. spent 45 minutes explaining to somebody that typical means it is a member of the class and atypical means it's not a member, and uh, <sighs> away for some reason, yeah. if you gave them this test, you might get things you know much closer to Maybe. one. Maybe. So in that case, you should get on these well-defined categories, you should get one for every member. Oh. Yeah. For example, like, 
if the people who were taking this test on TV had seen an ad and it had a phone number on it, the numbers that were in the ad that reoccurred more than once would be more typical to them than any yep. other numbers within the list. So like for example, like right now, uh, it, it is completely subconscious normally, but just sitting, just sitting here, I looked at cognition and I see three, 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 three. Those are the only numbers that I see. Yeah. And so to me, they're more common than the number six or a two. Like that two, I barely even saw. <laughs> I only really saw the three. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that like reoccurrence within a big period of time or prior to this experiment would have really affected their own definition of typicality? Could be, and there's a lot of psych literature showing priming effects. So if you, you can subconsciously prime somebody to be thinking about a topic, and then if you ask them later, they'll, re, they'll generate that later. So that's a, that's a potential confound here. It should even out if you're asking 100 people for their typicality gradients. Presumably they've seen different numbers during the day. Uh, so it should kind of average out. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this three is typical. Like, I can like, I but the typicality gradients were supposed to be the evidence that you use to build the empirical basis for the prototype theory. So if you, yeah, that's. I take it that that's a problem for the prototype theory. Yeah. So problem generating a problem. So if we show that typicality gradients are actually just familiarity, or they're subject to massive priming effects or people don't understand the instructions, or whatever, you've, you've shown that the evidential basis for the prototype theory is much thinner than you'd hoped it was. In mathematics, like they, everybody can usually agree that like pi is not repeating decimal number, it goes on and on, but mathematicians have found, for instance, there are patterns within pi's and or little bits and pieces where they kind of have structures to them. Like uh -huh. There is some kind of typicality or some, some repeating structure, or at least some kind of structure, at least bits and pieces of it. Are there not, is there not something fundamentally typical to something? Like whether something repeats itself in nature, whether something... I'm sorry, I don't think I follow the... I'm, I'm trying to say like, we're basing our typicality rating off of what we can measure from people, but is there a, a fundamental typicalness to something in the universe? I strongly suspect not. Because what makes them, specifically because of the I mean, the context effects that we see in the unstable typicality gradients seem to be a very intelligent thing that people do. Uh, and what they're doing is treating their concepts as context sensitive. And if they're context sensitive, that means that there's not just an objective fact about what's the most typical beverage. There's just not an objective fact about that. There's a most typical beverage in a context, perhaps. But that's different than saying that there's just a structure to the concept. Okay, so we got a lot of stuff to do today. So I'm gonna skip over this linear separability stuff. We'll come back to this when we do AI. Uh, this is gonna be a problem from some early AI, pro AI programs. So let's just skip over that and get into new, some new stuff, okay? Okay, I'm glad we got that discussion. That was a that was good discussion though. This is, again, this class kind of rolls tutorials and lectures into one thing. So it's good that we're discussing this and kind of clearing up questions and issues about the last lecture. That's why I'm doing this review mostly. So in case you're sitting there thinking, what are we doing? We learned this already. This is, this is part of the plan, okay? Okay, okay. I got one more problem for prototypes that I wanna to explain to you. It is by far the most technical and weird problem for prototype theory, so hang on. We'll try to do this in a not not spectacularly mathematical way, but there will be a little tiny bit of math involved. So this is a critique from Osherson and Smith, the same Osherson, Osherson and Smith from before. Uh, and their, their issue is, prototype theory makes it hard to evaluate the truth of quantified sentences. What does that mean? Okay, so one of the reasons that you wanna make or sorry, one of the reasons you want to have concepts is because concepts let you do things like evaluate the truth of sentences. Like the bottle is on the podium. That's a sentence. Presumably what you do is use your bottle concept and your podium concept and try to test whether that sentence was true. Okay, so testing the truth of sentences. Now what about the truth of quantified sentences? 
quantification is saying things like all x's are y's or some x's are y's. So if we want to test the truth of a quantified sentence, that's doing, that task is something like saying all cats are mammals. All cats are mammals is a quantified sentence. You want to be able to, I mean, we as humans absolutely need to be able to say things like that and be able to evaluate whether they're true or false, right? So if your theory of concepts doesn't show you how that's possible for us, your theory of concepts is missing a really important thing of, like we're not just going around categorizing things for the fun of it, right? That's not why we categorize. We categorize so that we can understand true or false claims about the world, to test true or false claims. So you want to say all electrons are negatively charged or uh, all classrooms in this university have chairs. Those are quantified sentences and you have to be able to evaluate their truth or falsity. So that's something that our theory of categorization should help underwrite. Yeah? Okay, so, and Osherson and Smith are gonna make the argument, they make it in this paper, that prototype theory makes some really weird predictions about our quantified sentences. That it makes predictions that don't make any sense in terms of quantified sentences. Okay? So I'm gonna go through this argument. It involves what's called fuzzy set theory. Fuzzy set theory. It's very cute and fuzzy. So, uh, so standard logic treats any sentence as true or false, right? It's either completely true, completely false. Fuzzy, or sorry, uh, prototype theory categorize things by degrees. So that seems to be a bad fit, right? Standard set, sorry, I should have said in this slide, standard set theory categorizes things as either in the category or out of the category. I shouldn't have said standard logic, although set theory is arguably part of logic, so. Uh, standard set theory, you're either in the set or you're not in the set, right? Anybody who's done set theory, there's not like, well, this is sort of in the set. Just like prototype theory does. Prototype set theory says, well, skis are kind of a vehicle. They're sort of a vehicle, okay? So logic is largely built on set theory. If we use logic to evaluate the truth of our sentences, that's worrying, right? Because prototype theory does not fit with standard set theory. So what we need to do is combine prototype theory with some kind of logical system that allows us to evaluate the truth of sentences, right? We need to combine, so if we, if we have standard classical logic, we say all birds have wings, and we look at the set of all things that are birds, and that whole set is things that have wings, then we have a perfectly reasonable way of sort of combining our theory of concepts with our theory of logic to evaluate the truth of sentences, and that was a quantified sentence. Prototype theory looks like it makes that hard because it gives us answers like skis are kind of a vehicle, okay? So here's a really natural way of trying to solve that problem. Here's a really obvious, not obvious, but like, here's the best shot that we have at dealing with the problem that prototype theory with its fuzzy categorizations fits very poorly with set theory, standard set theory. What we're gonna do is move to fuzzy set theory. Fuzzy set theory, categorizes things by degrees. So, it's my favorite example. In fuzzy set theory, so consider the class of bald men and non-bald men. There's two classes, men who are bald, men who are not bald. Now, where on this chart do you draw the hard and fast line between those two classes? This, this male pattern baldness chart. Maybe you don't need to. So standard set theory, you're either in the set or you're out of the set. Fuzzy set theory allows us to say, well, you're mostly in the set. You're kind of in the set. You're extremely in the set or extremely not in the set. Yeah? So it says set membership is a matter of degrees. And that's good for prototype theory, right? So if we wanna combine prototype theory with some kind of logical system, Fuzzy set theory seems like a really natural fit, a really natural way of 
producing sentences that we could evaluate for truth value. So, Osherson and Smith argue that the very plausible combination of prototype theory and, set theory and fuzzy set theory, unfortunately, actually generates a bunch of problems. So, this thing that we want out of our theory of categories, or categorization, we want out of our theory of categorization the ability to say how we evaluate sentences and standard set theory is not going to give us that. If we got prototype theory and standard set theory, that's not going to work. We need something on the logical side of this. Fuzzy set theory is a really natural way of going about this, but unfortunately they make the argument fuzzy set theory and prototype theory gives us some very counterintuitive results. They're not going to work well together and there's not an obvious alternative. So that's the basic argument. So far, so good. Okay. So let's talk about fuzzy set theory. We'll do a little bit of fuzzy set theory, and we'll come back around and talk about how this, how this produces problems, okay? So this is Fred. Say hi to Fred. Fred meets the grizzly bear prototype with a value of one. So if we're going to categorize Fred, say we've got the category of grizzly bears, Fred meets that category with full value. So say one is the most you can fit into the category. Say zero is the least, one is the most, Fred's a grizzly bear, so he meets the grizzly bear prototype perfectly. Yeah? Okay. Here's Alfred. Alfred is a polar bear. Hi, Alfred. Uh, he fits the grizzly bear prototype with a value of, let's say, 0.8. I'm making these numbers up. The numbers don't matter. Uh, let's assume that we can ignore all of the problems with prototype theory, like unstable typicality gradients, coming up with values, all that stuff. Let's, just, let's ignore all that and imagine that we can say how well a single object, like Alfred the polar bear, fits the category grizzly bear. Now, Alfred has not all of the pro properties of grizzly bears, of course. He's a polar bear, but he's got most of them, right? He's got big paws, and he's got a snout, and he's a bear, right? So he's got most of the features that are typical of grizzly bears. So we'll give him a 0.8. Okay. And this is Sam, Sam the squirrel. Sam meets the grizzly bear prototype with a value of, let's, I'm just making it up again, let's say 0.1. Does, although Sam has some properties in common with a grizzly bear. It's got fur, got claws, I guess, tiny little claws. Most of the properties of grizzly bear, let's say Sam doesn't have. Okay, so this is the basic idea of fuzzy set theory. You got a category and you say, is this object in the category? And you can sometimes say, yes, definitely. And sometimes say, uh, mostly. And sometimes say, nah, not really, yeah? Okay. It's like you're talking about grizzly bears. You're not talking about bears in general. Grizzly bears have a different set of distinct features from. So you're saying they don't have the necessary features to be a. But prototype theory doesn't believe in necessary and sufficient conditions. Prototype theory believes that your proto. So in prototype theory, your grizzly bear concept is really just a list of features. And some of them are, you know, got fur, it's got claws, lives in North America. Um, okay, so if that's, and you can be missing some or most of them. If that's disastrously wrong, if that doesn't work at all, prototype theory kind of doesn't work at all. So the argumentative move that's being made here, so consider the argumentative move that's being made here, and it's a really good move in general. This is a really good move to make. If you want to destroy somebody's theory, the best way to go about it is to take on as many of their assumptions as you possibly can. So what Osherson and Smith have done here is say, okay, let's imagine that I can build a typicality gradient. Let's imagine that I can build a context insensitive rating for how well a certain object fits a category. Let's imagine that we don't have any of these weird problems with prototype, prototype theory, and we can just stick a number on it. Uh, so 
The problems with prototype theory are very real and we shouldn't forget about them, but for the purposes of this argument, they're saying, let's suppose all of that works even. Yeah? Does that, does that help your concern at all? Um, but I feel like if you ask people how typical of a grizzly bear is a polar bear, most people would give it close to like 0.1 or something. Okay, the numbers are made up. The numbers don't matter. Yeah, but is that, don't even think it's close to reality, really, the numbers. Would you be happier with 0.1? Okay, it doesn't matter what the numbers are. Okay, okay, sorry, I saw your hand first. Yeah. Why this judgment though, of like if everything is somewhat in relation to a polar bear, doesn't that category which the polar bear category exists in, isn't it filled with like infinitely other objects inside it that are related to varying degrees of certainty to a polar bear? Like doesn't that yep. just defeat the purpose of having a category in the first place? No, no, because if something is point zero 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 one percent of polar bear or grizzly bear, it's not really in the category, yeah? But it still is according to this. Like, it, it, it's just well, very, very small. Yeah, it's not completely not in the category, but it's not deep in the category. So what, this, is, this is an implication of prototype theory all along, that things get categorized by degrees. So at what point does it become a grizzly bear? Well, there's no, there's no hard and fast cutoff. Again, this was right in the core of prototype theory, that there's not one point where it's either in the category or it isn't. It's the fuzzy boundaries thing. And we had to have that. That's a necessary feature of the prototype theory because one of the problems with classical theory was that it had these hard and fast boundaries. And we found that that was a hugely problematic feature of the theory. So having fuzzy boundaries is one of the things that we wanted out of, it's one of the design features of prototype theory. But are yeah. only the boundaries fuzzy? So if you ask someone, is this scroll a grizzly bear? They'd say no, and you'd give it a zero, right? It's only the boundaries. Well, so the, the, the number is generated by the following method. A prototype is just a list of features, right? So it's a list of features weighted by their importance. The number of those features that you have times their, their relevance is the number that you get here. Yeah? I mean, this, this is, these are good questions, but these are questions for the prototype theory, not really for this argument. Yeah? Well, I think prototype does it not give like a threshold or some fuzzy threshold? It says that, okay. Nope. All right. Nope. It's just you get the rating of however many features that you share, that's what your rating is. So if you share zero features, so suppose your prototype for a bear has 20 features and you, you hold up a rock and say, is this a bear? And it shares none of the features, then you get a zero. So that's one way to get a zero. That's one way to have an absolute zero. It depends how many features there are in the prototype. If you've got 100,000 features and one of them is, has mass, then anything that has mass is like sort of in the category. If that's not one of your features, then no. Okay, okay. So, uh, back to fuzzy set theory. So, here's what's called a characteristic function in fuzzy set theory. This is a function that takes the set, so C of the set, and that's the characteristic function of this set for x, which x is some specific object. Okay, so the x is an object, so c of the category grizzly bear for Sam the squirrel, we've decided is 0.1. Yeah? Oh, is that, so you say for this given category and this given object, how much does that object fit the category? We've given, we've given Sam a 0.1. Again, the numbers, I'm absolutely just making up these numbers out of nowhere, so. Okay, yeah. Is this like symmetrical with respect to, is let's say the category of squirrels or the polar bear just as then by this regard? Uh, depends on how many features are in each prototype. So. <laughs> if, if, if we can just define features arbitrarily as an infinite amount of features that we can get to something. Yep. If, that's the, if we can define an object that has an arbitrary or infinitely a large amount of features that we can give to it, and we can then compare it to another object that has an infinitely large amount of features that are arbitrary to it, like, how can we ever come to a conclusion that this is 0 0.1 in comparison to this, and this is 0 0.8 in comparison to this? A devastating critique of prototype theory. There needs to be a, you would need to give some very clear story about how you come up with a feature list and recall that that's one of the problems with prototype theory, is that they don't tell us how you come up with these lists. Yeah. It's worth noting that there are 
reasonable ways to compare infinite sets? You can say like yep. half of all integers are even. Yep. Yep. You can use how, I'd say correctly reduce an infinite set to some finite thing that people can easily understand. You can use measure theory, which is a perfectly good mathematical tool for comparing the size of even real valued infinities. Yep. Okay. Have we got characteristic fun function? What this does, what this does is just tell the C of some thing given X is just how characteristic the object is of that category. Yeah? Okay. If that's fine, let's take 10 minutes. We'll come back and I'll deliver the, the actual argument. So I've just been setting you up for this argument. Come back in 10 minutes. I'll give you the argument. We got as far in this argument as talking about uh, what we need, what we would like. So just to remind you where we're at in this thing. You need some way of using your theory of concepts to talk about how we evaluate the truth of sentences. That's where we started, right? You don't want to just, you don't just go around the world categorizing things. You go around the world trying to determine true facts, right? True facts about the world, partly based on the categories of things. So we need some, something to combine with prototype theory in terms of a theory of logic or a theory of reasoning or something like that. We found that Standard set theory seems to be a poor fit. We thought maybe fuzzy theory, fuzzy set theory would do a better job. And then I just started telling you about fuzzy set theory. So we talked about characteristic functions. So the characteristic function given a category of an object is how well that object fits the category. We've been making up numbers. Uh, let's say the squirrel is 0.1. Okay, now the next thing to get is quantified sentences, evaluating the truth of quantified sentences. So here's a quantified sentence. All grizzly bears live in North America. So that's a sentence. It's quantified because it says all. So it's a sentence about all of the, ob all of the objects in this category also belong in this category. So in standard set theory, that's really easy to evaluate. So if the, suppose this inner circle is a set of all grizzly bears, the outer circle is a set of all things that live in North America. If the inner circle is inside the outer circle or doesn't go outside of it, then the, se the sentence is true, right? If the set of all things that are grizzly bears is strictly contained within the set of all things that are inhabitants of North America, then the sentence, all grizzly bears live in North America, is true. So no problem. Here's how they do it in fuzzy set theory. Okay. So. That top line, suppose X is Fred. Fred's our grizzly bear. And we've got a characteristic function for Fred, given the set of grizzly bears. And we've got a characteristic function for inhabitant of North America. So suppose we plug Fred into that. So that sentence, all grizzly bears live in North America, is true, just in case for anything that you can substitute in for X, the characteristic function of it being a grizzly bear is less than or equal to the characteristic function of it being an inhabitant of North America. Okay, take a minute, yeah. Shouldn't it be like comparable, like shouldn't the new X be comparable to that of Fred rather than like it being less than an inhabitant of North America? Sorry, sorry. So, the new x, so this x, we, we've got Fred plugged in for one of our x's. The idea here for the quantified sentence is for any object that you can plug in for x. So we say for any given object. So for this chair, is the characteristic function of this chair being a grizzly bear less than or equal to the characteristic function of it being an inhabitant of North America? And then we do this chair and this chair and this bottle. We do Fred, we do me. We do every object in the universe. This is how quantified sentences work. So say, for any object in the universe, is it always true that its characteristic function of being a grizzly bear is less than or equal to the characteristic function of it being an inhabitant of North America? Yeah? If Fred is also like graded as like a one, I guess a prototype of North America, as well as being a grizzly bear, yeah. like, wouldn't that then make Fred the prototype of yeah, yes, so in that case, they both come out as one, and it's true that it's less than or equal to. But then doesn't that kind of defeat the, like, because then you could have multiple prototypes of inhabitants of North America. 
Mm, we're assuming there's only one. Why does, why does this give us multiple? Well, I guess it's more of a criticism of like, probability theory itself. Uh, but, like, uh, if you had squirrels, like 100% squirrels live in North America, uh -huh. right? So then the inhabitants of North America, the prototype of the inhabitants of North America would be squirrels. So, so there would be multiple prototypes for one particular category. Well, okay. So think about, think about, let's think about the prototype for inhabitants of North America. What are the important features of inhabitant of North America? What pick out something is belonging to that category? That's pretty much it. Yeah. But does that, does that really reflect how people think about prototypes? Um, Could there be multiple prototypes for a single category? That's what I'm asking. If there are, that's disastrous for prototype theory. Okay. So then there's criticism of prototype theory. Yeah. yeah. So in, in this case, let's just assume that the prototype of inhabitant of North America has exactly one feature. Its feature weight is maximum, and it's just, does this thing, is this thing in North America? Yeah? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, to respond, I think it's, um, it would be more accurate to say that there are multiple things which match the prototype. Right, right. So there's lots of, yeah, there's lots of objects that would get a one for inhabitant of North America. I live in North America, you live in North America, we all live in North, given that we're all in North America right now, I'm fairly confident, we all get a one for inhabitant of North America. Yeah? So that means that uh, this is true just in case if it's being a grizzly bear is less than or equal to being an inhabitant of North America for anything that you can plug in there, then the sentence, the quantified sentence is true. Um, to make this argument work, I'd have to like, to make it intuitive why that's the way, and this is a very, just to be clear, this is a very standard way of evaluating quantified sentences in fuzzy set theory. So given fuzzy set theory, this isn't something that they made up for the purposes of this. Fuzzy set theory is just a branch of mathematics that has its own justification. So in fuzzy set theory, here's how you evaluate quantified sentences. So all they've done is taken this abstract bit of math and hooked it up with prototype theory and shown that it does this weird thing that I'll show you in a minute. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of asking you to take it on faith with it, without teaching you fuzzy set theory. I'm not sure I can make that formula super intuitive, but if you can take it on faith that this is how they do it, we can move on. Is that okay? Is this, is this, is this good? Okay. 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 So, so for Fred, this works. So Fred is a hundred percent grizzly bear, hundred percent living in North America. That means the C of grizzly bear for Fred is less than or equal to, in fact, it's equal to the C of uh, being an inhabitant of North America. So here's another example. We got, uh, we got Alfred. Here, Alfred's living in North America. Say he's up in Northern Canada. The C of Alfred for grizzly bear is 0.8, we said before, which is less than the C of him being an inhabitant of North America, which we, we can call one. So that's, once again, if you plug Alfred into this formula, it works again because it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't affect whether you think it's true that all grizzly bears live in North America if Alfred lives in North America. It's just irrelevant, right? So, so long as it's less than the C of Alfred being inhabited in North America, it comes out as true for that one, right? So quantified sentence, it's true if just for anything you can plug in here, it comes out as true every time. Yeah? I got two questions. Yeah. What about all tomatoes are fruits? Because then it would be uh, like a a normal tomato would have a one for being a tomato, but then like a point six for being a fruit. But all tomatoes are still fruits. If you know that tomatoes are fruits. Well, that's in in that case, uh, people's people are judging that tomatoes aren't fruits. Yeah. But then aren't you judging all for this? No, we're judging that he's, uh, this doesn't false, what this, what we're judging here is that it doesn't falsify the claim all grizzly bears live in North America. Right? That's all this slide is meant to show. Yeah, is it quick? I, I would like to move on because this is getting hairy. Well, that just makes it, no, hang on, hang on. But that just makes it false that all grizzly bears look in, so that's not a problem with the theory. That's just false. Like 0.8 for 
fruit and then uh, tomato as one, it doesn't, that, that equation doesn't hold anymore. Well, that's just categorizing tomatoes as not fruits. Can I, let me get to the argument. Let me get to the argument. Don't, don't pick holes in it until I've actually presented the argument, OK? OK. Because I know people are getting frustrated with this right now. So OK, here's the argument. Here's what's supposed to be a problem for prototype theory after all this time. So suppose we've got Sam the squirrel living on Mars. Here's a, here's a problem case. Here's Osherson. And by the way, I did not make up this example. This is Osherson and Smith's example. So uh, let's say that uh, Sam's characteristic function of being a grizzly bear is 0.1. And being very, very far from North America, Sam's characteristic function of living in North, North America is less than 1, 0.1. Let's call it 0 0.05. And if that's not below one for you, you can put them on Venus, you can put them on Alpha Centauri. Put Sam as far away as you need to get the characteristic function of Sam living in North America lower than the characteristic function of being a grizzly bear. Okay, so what just happened there? Now, this inequality doesn't hold. So we have found an X for which the characteristic function of it being a grizzly bear is not less than or equal to its characteristic function for being an inhabitant of North America. What that means is that Sam the squirrel on Mars has somehow falsified the claim that all grizzly bears live in North America. That shouldn't be, right? That shouldn't be relevant to evaluating whether all grizzly bears live in North America, right? Intuitively speaking, the presence or absence of squirrels on Mars is not super important to deciding whether all grizzly bears live in North America. I take it. Yeah. Isn't that? I mean, why, I mean, I'd say why not? Um, it could just be that grizzly bear is just a really poorly designed category. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you're you're willing to bite this bullet and say that the presence or absence of squirrels on Mars is relevant to deciding whether all grizzly bears live in North America? Well, I mean, I mean, prototype theory is a lot. Okay. Yeah. It's true. That, I mean, you, you have like these like infinite possibilities for like what is contained within a, a category. Mm -hmm. So I don't think this like I don't think the category would be reflective of how actual humans or like thinking things make categories. But if if we're yeah. to go based off of the assumption that like so, this is the fight, like this is fight set theory. The problem that, that we have is yeah. this squirrel somehow falsifies that grizzly bears can have in North America. It's like, well, technically, the squirrel is kind of sort of a, a grizzly bear. It's, it's a little bit, according to prototype it, theory. It's living on Mars, and technically, it doesn't exist in North America. That's a, that's a bold concession. That's a bold concession. Um, I think Osherson and Smith didn't expect you to be willing to accept that conclusion. They think that, they think that conclusion is so unpalatable that you're willing to throw out prototype theory. I agree with Osherson's initial motives in that I don't really think prototype theory right. is the answer. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, why does it have to be less than the grizzly bear or less than the inhabitant of So that's the bit I think I'd have to teach you fuzzy th set theory to explain. And I didn't prepare a slide on that. Sorry. Is it just because it's a, like inside the set of North America? It's, it's analogous to that, yeah. But could, couldn't like, Inhabit North America be like a characteristic of the grizzly bear, not an encompassing. I, mean, I guess it's the same thing. Um, I think yeah, it gets more complicated if you try to nest the two categories that you're comparing for sure. Um, yeah, read the read the Osher Senate. They'll they'll give you a little bit more. Read the read the. I think that was the reading for today. So check it check it out. They'll give you a little bit more explanation for why they think this is a the, and like basically. This is just the standard way of evaluating quantified sentences in fuzzy set theory, and they just sort of import it into their theory. Yeah, yeah. Wow, you bit the bullet. That's very, that's very bold. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, if we're willing to accept that this is not how people think, then like you don't, when you're thinking through whether all grizzly bears live in North America, the presence or absence of not like squirrels on Mars doesn't actually factor into how our processes process, then I guess the argument gets where it was going. 
Not the way they hoped it would get there, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I feel like this is just um, showing that fuzzy set theory isn't compatible with prototype theory. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what what they've one way of taking this is to say, okay, Osherson and Smith, you said fuzzy set theory would be a good combination. Maybe it's not. Maybe there's some other theoretical apparatus we could use here. You haven't, they certainly haven't given us a survey of all of the possible ways of doing this or shown us why any other way. So what they did was say, regular set theory, that's not going to work. Here's the only other thing, fuzzy set theory. Fuzzy set theory doesn't work, the end. Uh, so if you, if you, you might be happy to say, like, look, we just need to expand our horizons here and come up with a better theory. So, yeah, yeah, good. So we can, we've got a few possible responses to this. We could just say, sure, Sam's a kind of a grizzly bear. And therefore, Sam shows that not all grizzly bears live in North America. Or we could say, look, this is clearly just, we just give up on prototype theory from the beginning, so we don't even have to think in these terms. Or we could say, look, maybe fuzzy set theory is not the end, but is not the way of dealing with this. But that doesn't show that there is not a way of dealing with this. So several, several possible responses to this. OK. OK. So. Broadly, in summary, Douglas Medine has the following to say, had the following to say back in 1989 about prototype theory. Uh, prototype theories imply constraints that are not observed in human categorization, predict insensitivity to information that people readily use, and fail to reflect the context sensitivity that is evident in human categorization. Rather than getting at the character of human conceptual representation, prototypes appear to be more a caricature of it. That's his claim. Uh, this was back in 1989. By the way, prototype theories are still under research. People are still working on these, trying to make them work. So this is not the case that people just gave up on prototype theory. And in fact, I think I mentioned before, if you open up a psych textbook and they ask how do concepts, you look up how do concepts work, they'll probably tell you some story much like the prototype theory. So this is not the end of the prototype theory story. What I tried to give you is just sort of an overview of what's going on in it and some of the major problems with it. Is that, is that fair? Okay. Okay, let's take a step back now. So let's, let's zoom out a little because we've had a frustrating series of failures, haven't we? I mean, not, it's not like we were coming up with these theories, but it's been annoying. I'm sure it's been at least somewhat annoying to see these theories advanced and then knocked down again and advanced and knocked down again. So one thing that is reasonable to do after you've had a series of failures, and this is very general, is to try to figure out what's common between your failures. This is actually a pretty good strategy for diagnosing what's going on. So here, let's think about some shared presuppositions of the classical and prototype theory, the resemblance theory as well, because it's very much like the prototype theory. So everything that we've talked about so far has made the following two assumptions. Concepts are feature lists. Concepts are just lists of things that the thing being talked about has. Everything that we've done so far has worked with this as a presupposition. Maybe that's part of the problem. Furthermore, what concepts do, another, another supposition, what concepts do is just to describe or label the world rather than try to help to explain the world. I propose to you that those are quite different activities. So all of prototype does is just list off a bunch of features rather than tell you about the structure of a thing. So maybe those shared pre presuppositions were part of the issue that we were having. Maybe those suppositions that seemed really obvious, like this one of the reasons why I gave you the classical theory is because this supposition that concepts are feature lists is exceptionally old, exceptionally widespread, and very, very intuitive for most people. Uh, but maybe it's wrong. Maybe that's part of what's been tripping us up this whole time. So maybe instead of being disconnected lists of features, our concepts can say, contain some kind of internal structure. That's 
a thing that's been missing from all of our theories. Uh, so the Gestalt psychologists talked about this like a century ago. Uh, the notion that when you're perceiving the world, you're not just perceiving a bunch of unconnected bits and pieces. What you're perceiving is a connected whole. Uh, hopefully everybody can see the two ways of formulating this image as a whole. There's a duck and there's a rabbit. Yeah, okay, good, okay, good. So this is a super, this image comes from the Gestalt psychologists who investigated the way that we perceive the world as a series of structured holes. Um, and in a way, people were, people were giving the, the psychology researchers evidence that this is what their concepts were like. So they would say, what are the features of a table? And people would say things like, well, it's got sturdy, sturdy legs that hold up a flat surface so that you could put stuff on it. Now, what they just gave was not just that it has legs, that it has a top. They gave a causal that is sturdy, right? It's good at holding things up and a functional description of a table that it's for holding things up. So it's not just a description, it's a causal functional whole. Right? So people were, people were giving this kind of description. When you ask what's a bird, what's a table, people were giving causal functional descriptions, right? Things that have to be a structure, like a, when you say this is a chair, it, why is it a chair? Because it's for sitting on. Why has it got the causal properties that it does to support that function? You're not just listing off features of the thing, individual, isolated, atomic features. You're describing the way the features come together as a structured whole. Okay. Uh, part of the problem with capturing this, and the, the psych researchers would just edit out that stuff. They wouldn't record the fact that it's causal or functional. You just say, ah yes, strong legs, flat top. That's what a table is, right? Uh, part of the problem here is that it's much harder to put into words the causal functional unity of a thing than it is to put into words the features. So if I say, what are the features of a bird? Well, it's got a beak and it's got wings and it's got feathers and it flies. Okay, I've listed off a bunch of features. So if I put on the table in front of you a beak and some wings and some feathers and I throw it all up in the air, you don't go, aha, a bird, right? What that lacks is the causal functional unity of a bird, right? The, the wings are attached to the feathers because that helps it to fly so that it can go eat bugs and continue to be alive, right? All of the parts of the bird are meaningfully integrated into a functional unity, right? It's not just that it has wings or that it has legs. It's that the wings help the legs like stay together as a whole, right? Yeah. Is that functional not unity also dependent on the goal? Like we, we Absolutely. The way. Yeah. Like, yeah. So uh, there's a lot of literature on that actually. Um, so the goal, so Kant writes about this actually. So Kant, and we'll, we'll come back to Kant when we do philosophy of mind actually. So the goal of a living thing in some sense is to stay alive and to continue its species. Not necessarily to personally reproduce, but to, so like for example, most ants never reproduce, almost 99.9% .9 of ants never reproduce probably more than that, but they keep their species alive. Uh, you can ask functional questions about the parts of a living thing, for example. So, and this is something that at no point in biology did biologists stop using this functional language. So what is the heart for? The heart is for pumping blood. Why does a tree have leaves? It has tree, the tree has leaves to catch the sunlight. Why does it catch the sunlight? So it can produce the tree, right? So there's these kind of causal functional loops in living things. Yeah. 
different animal, but I, I've given that a bit. I don't know what the goal of the animal is. There is a literature called the inactivist theory of mind, uh, Tom, Evan Thompson's Mind and Life, that argues, just as an example, that argues that what characteristic of living things is that we generate our own goals. So the tree's goal, it's not me telling the tree that its goal is to stay alive, the tree's goal is to stay alive. Um, this is controversial. Um, I'm probably a weird person to ask about this because my PhD advisor was uh, Dennis Walsh, and Dennis Walsh was one of the only people arguing for, like one of the rare people, not the only people, one of the rare people arguing that there are actually purposes in nature, specifically in living things. Uh, it's not a popular view, and, but nonetheless, I got indoctrinated in it because he's my PhD advisor. So I likewise think that living things have purposes built into them, uh, that they have their own goals, and goal making and goal breaking is one of the things that makes us intelligent and makes us alive. Uh, so, but that's a controversial position that many, many people do not agree with. So, yeah. Okay. So, but, okay, to, to draw this back to, to draw this back to concepts. Uh, so, one way of perhaps diagnosing the failure of all of the theories that we've looked at so far is that they treated concepts as though they were just lists of features. And actually, concepts have a kind of internal structure and internal unity that makes them coherent in a way that lists of features are not coherent. Remember when we started off this thing, we were talking about categories versus sets. A set is just a list, it looks like a collection of things. A category is supposed to hang together in some important way, right? That was the whole goal of this discussion was to understand how categories work. Categories are supposed to be unified somehow. They're not just, they're just, not just a collection of things. And maybe it's unsurprising that when we dig down into what a category is, that it has this kind of unifying synthetic connective quality to it. So, okay, that all sounds very nice, Corey. How are we gonna make that into a theory? Um, again, the Gestalt psychologists were studying this stuff 100 years ago, but here's a much more modern version of this. Let's call it the theory theory, or the micro theory. So. If you go anywhere but U of T Cogsci, they call it the theory theory. Uh, I find that to be a weird and clunky name, so we're gonna call it the micro theory. Basically what the micro theory says is that a concept is a little micro theory. It's a little theory that you have about some aspect of the world. So the structure of a concept, this thought goes, is the structure of a theory. And a theory is clearly not just a list of features of the world, right? When you learned physics in high school, when you learned some Newtonian mechanics, you didn't just learn mass, force, volume, acceleration. Like that's not how it worked, right? What you learned was a collection of rules, rules of inference. That if you have this much mass, it's got this much gravitational attraction. And those rules were linked together into a, like a tight unity, right? The law of gravitation has something to do with the law of Momentum, right? The three, Newton's three laws fit together in this important way, right? They are, they are connected such that when you make an inference using one of them, it can lead to or feed from an inference from the other, right? So they're a set of rules that are connected. This is a, this is a bold hypothesis and this is again, Good cognitive science, because what they're doing is saying, maybe we can take something from philosophy of science and learn about psychology, right? So what they're doing is saying, let's think about how science works, and maybe that's how our minds work. So uh, this was originally proposed by Morton back in 1980. Uh, so concepts are like little theories and those little theories are trying to explain causal, structural, functional features of the world. That's the, that's the view we're going to look at now. So, uh, Alison Gopnik, who was, I think she might have been at U of T when she wrote this uh, back in 1988, uh, Conceptual and Semantic Development as Theory Change. So she asks, what is a theory? 
theory, she says, is a set of rules of inference governing the manipulation of theoretical entities. So when you learn Newtonian mechanics, you learn how to make inferences using those rules. The laws of, the laws of Newtonian mechanics are kind of rules you can use to manipulate uh, the theoretical entities that you're talking about. And what theories do is explain the world rather than just describe it, often by citing the causes of things. So maybe that's what our concepts are like. Furthermore, theories can change as new data comes in. So Gopnik's work was largely on uh, infant development. So let me tell you a really short story right now about infant development. And the, th the idea is, as infants are developing their concepts about the world, what they're really doing is acting like little scientists. So take, for example, the concept of object permanence or just objects. Okay? So when a baby is like, you know, the peekaboo peek game, right? You hide your face and the kid's like, wow, you're back again. You disappeared. You're back. Wow. So at age four to five months or so, infants can respond to objects that have disappeared, right? So if you shut off the lights, they're still able to reach for the object. So the, they have the idea at around four or five months. At, before four to five months, they just, the world to them is just unique individuals just happening and happening. After four or five months, you shut off the lights or you cover their eyes, they can still re they'll still reach for an object, right? Or if you, shut, if you turn back the, the lights back on, they're still like, they're not surprised to see the object still there. Okay, so they have, it's not that they have no notion of object permanence, but they have a very rough notion that the object's still there if you can't see it. Uh, at five to six months, uh, babies can do the following. So if something is, if it goes, so my bottle's gonna go behind the screen and you're all gonna make the brilliant prediction that it's still there, right? We're all doing this inferential thing where, whoa, it's still there. So for a, for a baby earlier than five months, so what they do, when they're studying babies, they, they evaluate how interested they are by how long and hard they look at something. So from, from five to six months, if you take an object and put it behind something and then it reemerges, the baby's not that interested. Because it's like, yeah, that's what I expected to happen. That's not, you're not blowing my mind here. Before that, they're like, the bottle disappeared. Oh my God, there's a whole new bottle, right? So they don't have the notion that after four to five months, they gain the notion, their, their concept of object or object permanence develops to the point where they get that something can be behind something, but it, that it's still there. What they don't yet have is uh, that an object, if you say put a blanket over it or put it in a box. So at four to five months, if you put something in a box, they're like, it's gone. That's, that's object is, and if you, and then you take it out of the box, they're like, wow, it's back again. Just like with the, just like with the peekaboo game, right? So uh, somewhere between uh, sort of like four to five to five to six months, their object permanence concept gets upgraded. And uh, sort of six months after, even at six months, when you put something under a blanket or uh, in a container, they're still surprised when it comes back. At 12 months, they've got kind of a full-fledged notion of object permanence. They get that things can go in a box and come back and it's still going to be there. They get that, uh, they especially get that if it's behind something, it's still going to be there. They have the full-blown predictive theory that objects that you can't see still exist. Right? So, First, they develop the really basic. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. But, but they do that much. Yeah, they do that much. They do that much later. Um, so that could be to do with. So object is one con concept they need to develop. Theory of mind is another whole level of development. So the idea that if you're hiding under a blanket, maybe the idea is if I can't see you, you can't see me. But that involves a much more complex inference about what's going on in your mind. 
right? So what they, maybe what they don't yet have is, even though you can't see me, you can predict where I'm gonna be, but that's making predictions about your predictions, which is a pretty fancy thing that we can all do, but babies are, little children are probably still working on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, if you do, yeah, if you're before they've developed object permanence, the baby will find that amazing, but that's just because babies find everything amazing because everything is a surprise to them, right? If you're, if you're unaware that once an object like moves, if I go like this, they're amazed, that's a magic trick for babies, just as much as a, a complex sleight of hand is a magic trick for babies. So yeah, they're just, they're just constantly amazed. Well, it's not clear that they haven't done any categorization. Uh, really, really early, they can tell the difference between mom and not mom. They, can, they will respond very directly to that. Babies will also, they'll respond in complex ways to their world, but they haven't got, so the argument here is that what they're developing is theories about the world. So you first you have to categorize to develop a theory, sort of, well, uh, like you need more than zero categorization. Anyway, I'm not I'm not an expert in child development. But, yeah. So like, kind of think almost as bad. We're basically saying that before we're saying that concepts were needed to construct, I guess, cognition. Which a part of that would be like developing theories. And what we're saying now is that theories are what develop. Categories. So, so. Uh, well, the claim is that theories just are concepts. So if you ask what is a concept, the answer that uh, somebody like Gopnik is gonna give you is that it's a theory. So how we figure out theories is we have to play it. Yeah. It seems kind of circular. I mean. You jump, you, you got it. You jumped, you, you jumped to the end there and yeah, that's, that's gonna be one of the problems here. Um, so this is a, what you're asking me to kind of summarize a whole field here. It, this is not the only evidence, line of evidence oh, okay. they have for this. So the child development is like a whole, it's a whole thing unto itself. So we'd have to get, we'd have to get deeper than I know about child development to answer that question. So I don't, yeah, I just don't have the, I just don't have the robust background to be like, here's all the answers to how they know that it's this rather than that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a good, it's a really good question. It's just, I don't know the answer. <laughs> okay, yeah. Is this kind of like hardware dependent, if you will? Like if, heaven forbid, I, I shoved the baby for you know a year in a black box and only fed it with it so they <laughs> understand object permanence. Is it a, a matter of brain complexity of like, as they're growing or as they're absorbing information from their environment? And where does the information, to absorb information from the environment come from? So that's horrible, first off. Um, uh, okay. Um, if you don't touch a baby in the first year of its life, it dies. So, yeah. Yeah. So the brain doesn't develop without stimuli, and what a baby does is, if you if so, the little I know about child development, if you watch children in action. What they do is try everything that they can. They try to break things, they try to throw things, they see what happens. So they're, they're constantly probing and interacting with their environment. And if you don't let them do that, their brains won't develop. Like they won't develop, well they'll develop, but they won't develop along the, the, nor, the like standard lines. So it's a rich, rich interaction between, it's an active, what kids are doing is a very active exploration of their environment to try to test things like, you know, if I, if I throw the, the toy, does it come back? Like, it will. I came to like a collection of features beforehand before like we, you kind of amass your list of features in this baby phase of interacting with the environment and then you kind of come up with your theories or. I don't know what, the, I don't know what they start from. I don't know what the baby's universe is like. like what, 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 what leads to that? Like what propels them to interact with the environment? Um, 
so if the question, you started from a question about like hardware versus sort of software, yeah. there's got to be some built-in hardware. There's got to be. Um, there's got to be some built-in motivation to explore. Uh, not all animals act like human babies. Not all animals are like trying to destroy everything around them, which is a, basically destructively testing their environment seems to be a really strong instinct in human babies, and not everybody does that. Like a gazelle comes out of its mom, and it's like, I'm a gazelle. Like it's just kind of hardwired. So it seems to be something built into us. Yeah. Horrifying, horrifying things happen. If you don't let babies explore kind of relatively freely, horrifying things happen. But, 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 but how, how, how does like, a baby know that it's hurt? How do I know pain is bad? That's probably built in. Right. Yeah, yeah. So they, they spontaneously avoid pain from a pretty early age. So isn't there then like some core categorization we can boil it down for just built in rules and forms? Sure, pain? sure. Like, shouldn't we don't. Well, Shouldn't we be starting from there? But you have the most simplest kind of conversations. Is pain and am I being hurt? Yeah. There are important rules that you can somehow get <clears throat> back far enough that this is part of the brain responsible for this, and that's why we came to that decision. So we're certainly starting from there in the sense that child development psychology is a crucial part of the project. Um, but we're not just starting from there, at least for one reason is that like it's really hard to study babies almost the only responses you can get from them are orientation responses. So how, how long do they look at something is an indicator of how interested they are. But they might be interested with delight or with horror. Those things are very hard to quantify. So it's super hard to study babies. People don't want you to study their babies too much. Like they, they'll bring them in for a couple hours, but like it's much easier to get first year psych undergrads into the lab than babies. So like there's lots of them and you're allowed to do a lot more to first year psych students. Uh, so there's lots and lots of limitations. And furthermore, we're still getting a, we're still trying to work out the thing to be explained here. We're not even at the point where we know what the object of our, our explanations are supposed to be yet. So it's, I think it's early to say like, let's start from babies and work from there. There's yeah, serious, serious concerns with studying babies. That's not to say that studying babies isn't important. I, this is one of the reasons why I, bring into this, into this lecture is I think they're fascinating data points, but it, it's not the whole story for a variety of practical reasons most. Yeah. So hypothetically, babies are born with everything needed to be like a, a guided self-learning intelligence. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. Uh, if you just put a baby in the woods, they do not come up with human level intelligence. Well, that was the, the key word, guided. Ah, ah, I see, I see. So, yeah, okay. Um, and then all the information for a baby is encoded in one cell, right, at the start. Uh, also don't think that's true, but okay, go on. Uh, development, the, 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 the mother provides huge amounts of biological s infrastructure and support and development, releasing hormones at the right time, 
Uh, so just just the just the cell does not have the whole story of development in it. But okay, go on. Well, that raises interesting questions. Of, uh, if you took a, a fertilized egg and just put it in like a tube, it dies. And you, you fed it maybe the right mix of hormones and okay. nutrients. Okay. What would you get from that? That's okay. Relevant. I feel like you're driving at something here. Yeah. So couldn't we, assuming the previous stuff was uh, totally bulletproof, uh, say that we only need like four megabytes or so of information to code for like a, a self somewhat self-learning intelligence, because that's about the uh, amount of data in the human DNA. A st strong disagree on that one, <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is assuming that the, I think my objection to this is too lengthy. Okay, so the, the notion that your DNA tells you everything about you is turning out to be wrong. So that was the notion of how we related to our DNA that was most of the 20th century. That was the, that was the received view. But uh, there's current, we're currently undergoing a revolution in biology where that's being strongly challenged. Uh, and the developmental process, so there are physical self-organizing developmental processes that make you, that build you, uh, and those processes are not just the information contained in the DNA. So the cellular matrix that you're in, the like, so the, the, the environment of the mother, there's huge amounts of extra stuff that's necessary to get from DNA to human that's not just contained in the DNA. Uh, Could you reduce that to saying like the information of the DNA with the appropriate compiler? Like the <laughs> yeah, but, the, the yeah, but the, the appropriate compiler is the sum of human civilization. So you're right. It's not wrong, but the completely specifying the compiler is, that's a task. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let me do one, one or two more things. We'll take a break and there's more. We, we got more to get through today. We might do the three whole hours today. So prepare yourself. All right. So um, what the, the micro theory suggests that what babies are going through are like paradigm shifts in science. So remember this stuff about paradigms where each science, each discipline kind of has its own set of rules and assumptions. It's got its own methods. That's a paradigm, right? And we're, we in cognitive science are like, oh man, I wish I had a paradigm. That'd be great. Um, Kuhn talks about paradigm shifts. So like 95% of the time, a given like scientists, 98% of the time, scientists work within a paradigm but once in a while, they have to shift from one paradigm to another. They have to kind of throw out a whole bunch of their basic assumptions, uh, uh, their ba basic methodologies, and shift to a new one. The most famous one is Newton to Einstein. So in Newtonian mechanics, space was just sitting there. There was at what they call absolute space. Everything has a definite uh, distance between everything else. There's simultaneity, so you can tell for sure there's an objective fact of the matter about whether two things happen at the same time or not, right? These were just all just assumptions. Newton didn't argue for any of this. It's just like, yeah, that sounds right. And then Einstein comes along and all of that gets thrown out. So in Einsteinian physics, in relativity, uh, whether two things happen at the same time depends on how fast and in which direction you're moving with respect to them, stuff like that. So the basic assumptions have to be thrown out. And it's kind of, it's, in, in Kuhn, at least, it's pictured of like long periods of stability and then a, a break, a revolution. This is the structure of scientific revolutions. So this is a revolutionary shift from one paradigm to another. And when we look at what's going on with babies, that's kind of what it looks like. So there's sort of relatively stable periods where they're at one stage of developing object permanence. They got the, it's still there when it's behind something idea, but they don't yet have, it's still there when it's under a blanket idea. And then they go through kind of Paradigm shifts, they have these little epiphanies where like, it's under the blanket, it's still there. Um, so child development seems to have this kind of like period of stability, big change, period of stability, big change. So even the history of science seems to be reflected in the development of individuals. That's kind of cool. Okay. Let's, uh, Let's talk more about micro theory. 
Got some real weird stuff for to finish this off. Uh, quickly, we'll talk about some of the advantages of this. So uh, one of the advantages is it explains that shifting typicality gradients that we saw before. So uh, micro theory has the nice advantage of helping to understand why our concepts behave differently in different contexts. So if there are theories meant to explain the world, that makes sense because you, you need different explanations for different contexts. If you have different explanatory goals, you get different explanations out. So why did the Titanic sink? Suppose I want an explanation for why the Titanic sunk. I think a pretty reasonable explanation is something like it hit an iceberg. Satisfied with that? Why did it sink? Hit an iceberg, cracked open, sank. Yeah? Okay, now, why did the Titanic sink at night? Different question, right? You need to cite different facts to explain why it sank at night. Why did the Titanic sink in the North Atlantic? I don't remember where it sank. I think it was the North Atlantic. Off the coast of Newfoundland. Thank you. Off of, why did the Titanic sink off the coast of Newfoundland? So it's a different question. You need different answers. Well, because its route was like this, right? So, but it's the same boat hitting the same iceberg sinking into the same sea, right? It's the same event, but to explain it, to, 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 if we ask for different explanations of it, we need different explanations, right? So what's salient to the exp explanation of an event can change depending on the context that you're in. And that's what, that was part of the weird thing about prototypes. You say, well, you know, if we change the context, the typicality gradients seem to shift around. But if your concepts aren't just lists, if your concepts are theories, that makes sense because theories explain things and explanations have this context sensitivity built in. Okay, that's helpful. It's a good start. Uh, it helps to explain why concepts have fuzzy boundaries. This is one of the advantages of proto prototypes, but so theories have fuzzy boundaries of application. When does, for example, can you use the theory of evolution to explain why uh, horses have hooves? Yeah, the answer, I'm not trying to trick you this, this time I'm not trying to trick you. Uh, yes, yes you can. Can you use the theory of uh, evolution to explain why the sun is the size that it is? No, I don't, think that, I don't think that you can. As far as I know, the answer is no. Can you use the theory of evolution to explain why societies change the way they do? And the answer is, there's just a huge debate about that right now. There's ongoing, an enormous debate about whether the theory of evolution applies to societies or not. We don't know. So it's unclear. So sometimes something's clearly within the purview of theory, sometimes things are clearly outside of it, but there's very often a wide range of like, hmm, maybe that is in the theory, maybe it's not. Yeah, so fuzzy boundaries, good. If concepts are theories, that predicts this context sensitivity, and it, ex it predicts the fuzzy boundaries of applicability. So, hey, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, here's this thing. It also matches how people actually explain their concepts. When you ask somebody to explain, you know, what's the concept of a table? What's important about your idea of a table? They really focus in on things like what tables are for. What causal properties do they need to have to fulfill that function? They don't just list off features. So this helps to explain why we act like that. That's nice. That's a nice advantage. Okay. So a few, a few little advantages of micro theory. Now I'm going to launch into a long thing about anthropology. Remember at the very first class I said anthropology is part of cognitive science? Well, the, the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to do some of that, and then there's not going to be any more anthropology. So enjoy this. Uh, I'm going to try to make the argument, so based on this very famous book by Mary Douglas called Purity and Danger, that the micro theory can actually help to explain a lot of how we behave in society, specifically with respect to what are called purity codes. So micro theory helps us to understand how we separate the world into clean and unclean. 
And that sounds, it probably sounds like it's easy, right? So probably your spontaneous inclination is to think, well, I know how we separate the world into clean and unclean. Things that give you diseases are unclean and things that don't are clean. But that cannot be the whole story. It cannot be the whole story. Uh, we know this from, so every culture has a purity code, every culture, which is a nice thing for anthropologists. They love stuff like that, like marriage. Like every culture has some version of commitment in pair bonding. It's different in every culture though. So what they like to do is go around to different cultures and see what's the same and see what's different. So purity codes are another thing. Every culture has a purity code. Every culture has some notion of what's clean and what's unclean. And I promise you that it does not, like there's some overlap from what will give you a disease, but I promise you that it's not total overlap. So for example, I'm not gonna actually do this, but so suppose that I swallow the saliva in my mouth. Okay, everybody okay with that? Suppose I take a sip from my bottle. Hmm. Delicious water. Now, suppose that I spit into my bottle seven times and then swish it up and then take a drink. Mmm. Okay. Now there's a kind of cringing like grossness to that, right? That made you that made you uncomfortable in a way that me, I swallowed my saliva, no problem. I drank some water, no problem. Doing both at the same time, you're like, Ugh! right? That's unclean. I actually, once in this very room, I actually did this to a group of undergrads. I, I spat in my coffee and drank it. It was gross. It grossed me out, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it here. Okay, so th that's clearly, it's my saliva. It's clearly not gonna make me sick, right? Right? This is, not a, this is not a disease, my own saliva is not a disease factor for me, but nonetheless, we've got a fairly universal sense that that's somehow like, ugh, it makes your skin, it makes, makes me grossed out, and I said it, right? Okay, so that's what's, a, what's called a violation of a purity code. Yeah. I don't know about that one in particular. I suspect it is. I suspect it is because what I've, uh, the, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll come back to why I think that's probably going to be universal later after I've kind of explained a bit more. Yeah. Can it be that like the factor is clean if that the water is pure, as pure water, not pure water and your saliva, and so you want to keep it as water? Well, it's certainly not anything that I add in there. So if I add some like flavor crystals, it's no longer pure water, but that's fine. But like it's not another, like, um, I guess, like you have like Neo and then yeah. syrupy, but like this yeah. is like a bodily fluid. Right, so I think that's the, that's the crucial bit. That's the crucial bit. So we'll come, let me come back to try to explain this in a bit, but yeah. Really? I'm from Ethiopia, and oh. when people get married, like they go through this process, and like people spit at them. Huh. And in North America, that would be just like the yeah. child. Yeah. But in certain contexts, it's positive. Okay, it's thank you. So it is not a cultural universal. Thank you. Very good. Okay. So okay. So back to back to purity codes in general. Okay. So let's get the idea of a purity code kind of kind of clearly in our minds. So please distinguish purity codes from moral codes, okay? So a moral code is your theory about what's right and wrong, right, in a, in a moral sense, like what it's bad to do. Uh, suppose you're a vegetarian for moral reasons. Uh, that's like, so I'm, I'm no longer a vegetarian, but I was for like a year, and I was, it's not that, it, it's not that meat didn't look delicious to me, cause it did, right? It called to me. And I would not have felt any, sh like, well, I would have felt a little bit of shame, but like, it's not that I thought it was gross to eat meat in the same way that I think it's gross to drink my own spit. Like that makes my skin, the spit thing makes my skin crawl, but the burger was just like, uh, I can't support factory farming. That's, that's not okay. So it's a kind of intellectual theory about what's right or wrong. Whereas 
Or for example, taking a, when you break a purity code, you feel shame, which is something like a loss of status. So uh, I think that there is absolutely nothing morally wrong with eating a bug, like eating a live cockroach. It's certainly not more wrong than eating a chicken sandwich, right? There's nothing worse, there's nothing at all worse, and it's probably better to eat a handful of cockroaches than a chicken sandwich. Suppose they were well cooked instead, no? No. No, you think it's? I mean, that could be you, but like, in my opinion, it's definitely better than a chicken sandwich. Morally speaking? Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Don't. I have the same question though. <laughs> okay. So Because to me it's like if you take it as morally, it's like, well, because your thing with like the vegan vegetarian thing is like yeah. you don't really have to eat meat. Yeah. So I'm vegan. Yeah. I don't eat it. Like I I wouldn't eat insects, I'd prefer to eat the chicken. Me too. Good. That's a good moral argument. That's very good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, it's an, intel, it's an intellectual argument. So you say the number of lives taken is, sorry, so good. Most, I think most people probably don't share this, this moral view that you say like, suppose, suppose I've got a chicken sandwich and just one bug. Most people wouldn't say, you're relatively unique in this regard. Most people wouldn't say that it's way worse, morally speaking, to eat the one bug than the one chicken sandwich. Would you? It depends on where your morality stands, right? So for instance, um, if you think that like you were bringing it back to farming, chickens are terrible for the environment in, as a whole. Uh -huh. But for instance, crickets are a very high source of protein. That's disgusting, but people, would, if your moral code so, is, I don't want to ruin the environment, Totally, totally. So this is the, that it's actually morally better. I think most people would say it's morally better off eating the cricket than the chicken sandwich. Chickens eat crickets. So like you're definitely, crickets are definitely dying here. So morally speaking, right, the, you're better off eating the chicken sandwich. But in terms of, you would have this weird gross feeling in some sense. You, you would in some sense lose social status from, from eating the bug. Like the weird kid in the playground ate bugs, right? And that's, that's kind of like, oh, don't hang out with that kid, he eats bugs, right? This kind of, I've eaten, I, like I've had a prepared bug, just to clarify. That's, but that's, there's nothing like, so what's, what's happening here is that there's a moral code about what's good or bad, right or wrong, and then there's a purity code about what's clean or unclean. And both of those vary across cultures. There's lots of cultures eat bugs. There's nothing intrinsic about bugs that makes them unclean to eat. They're fine to eat. There's nothing wrong with eating them, right? Okay, so just by way of getting moral codes and purity codes clarified, okay? So Douglas's thing is about purity codes. So why is it that we find some things clean and some things unclean? What is it? And she's got the following broad hypothesis. So her thesis is the following. People get really uncomfortable when you mess up their explanatory categories. So she thinks that's the basis of purity codes. How do we separate the clean from the unclean? Clean things fit our categories. Unclean things mess up our categories. Now, uh, Douglas distinguishes two ways of violating a purity code. There can be the gross way, and then there's the sacred way. So in lots and lots of cultures, uh, so one of the, here's, here's an explanatory category that's relevant to many, many cultures, men and women, right? When there's a strong gender binary, the way that you understand and explain people's behavior is often based on like your gender. So you can, many cultures, including ours, you get a really hard time for messing up the gender binary. In some cultures, they have a specific sacred uh, it's like social standing where this person is allowed to cross-dress because they are a sacred person, okay? So there's 
two way, there's two ways Douglas identifies both the like, you gross and ah, that's sacred ways of messing up the explanatory categories. We're gonna focus just on the you that's gross version, just for simplicity. This book is fantastic though. If, you, if you're interested, you should read it. So her thesis is things get classified as unclean when they mess up your explanatory categories. So back to the spit thing. Here's a really important explanatory category for our culture. Things that are part of my body and things that are not part of my body. As soon as the, sp it, the spit is in my mouth, it's part of my body. As soon as it exits my mouth, it's not part of my body anymore. Well, actually, it's kind of a little bit part of my body. Or like, somewhat, sort of part of my body. It messes up that really crisp explanatory category, right? And that's Douglas's explanation for why you would find that kind of gross. You've, you've taken something that is part of my body, and then it's not, and then it goes in again. Ugh. Think about somebody clipping their toes on the toenails on the subway. Toenails are, specific, are especially, some people find them just horrifying to look at, right? Because they're sort of alive, kind of bendy for a while, right? Right? They like, they're sort of a body part and sort of not. I mean, and, and this has nothing to do with disease prevention. So you'll touch the pole of the subway, right? That's way, like, way more serious. Some people are sensible and don't. If we were actually evaluating the safety risks, you wouldn't touch that pole, right? It's, and there's nothing worse about the toenail than the pole. That's what I'm saying. But the pole is not part of anybody's body, whereas the toenail is like, kind of. Ooh. Okay. So the, the theory here is you've got a bunch of categories, and those categories help to structure your world. You like those categories. You need them. They helped you to make sense of the world. They're like little theories. So to just bring this back to the micro theory, you got this constellation of little theories about how the world's gonna act. And when something messes up those theories, those categories, you don't like it anymore. You find it uncanny in some way, either in a sacred way or in a way that makes your skin crawl. So Douglas uses this on a bunch of things. Most famously, however, are the purity codes found in the, uh, the Torah, the the, what Christians call the Old Testament, the abominations of Leviticus. So this book of Leviticus has got a big long list of things that you're allowed to eat and things that you're not allowed to eat. And people debated for a really long time about like, why, why these things? Why are you allowed to what? So here's just a short, here's a short bit of it here. So from Leviticus, I bet you didn't expect to get Bible quotes today. Yeah, okay. So every animal that parts the hoof and has the hoof cloven in two and chews the cud among the animals you may eat. Yet of those that chew the cud or have the hoof cloven, you shall not eat these, the camel, the hare, or the rock badger, because they chew the cud but do not part the hoof and are unclean for you. And the swine, because it parts the hoof but does not chew the cud, is unclean for you. Their flesh you shall not eat, their carcasses you shall not touch. Okay, so uh, cloven hoof is just the kind of pig hoof. They've got these like two-part hooves. Chewing the cud is when you eat some grass and then it goes into like a secondary stomach and then you like bring it back up into your mouth and chew it for a while and then swallow it and bring it back up and chew it. That's called chewing the cud. Okay, so you can eat animals that chew the cud. That's fine. You can eat animals with cloven hooves. The features are not the problem. Douglas suggests here's what explains the pattern of clean and unclean. Uh, the people who wrote this farmed a lot of animals that both had cloven hooves and chewed the cud. They found those features to go together nicely, right? They hung together in their heads. So in their explanatory categories about the world, they've got animals with this constellation, this connection of features, and animals that don't have it. And having like half of it but not another is disturbing. And it messes up your categories. What you want is for these things to hang together in an important way, right? So it's, again, it's not like having hooves is bad. They eat lots of animals with hooves. It's not like not having hooves is bad. They also eat animals without hooves. Not like chewing the cud is bad. They eat animals that chew the cud. 
It's not like eating, anim like eating animals that don't chew the cud is bad. It's not either the feet, it's not the problem is not at the feature level. The problem is when the features aren't integrated in a way that they find explanatorily satisfying. Now, I presume that none of you in here are pastoralists, you're not living, you're not raising animals for subsistence. So probably having this constellation of categories, features doesn't really mean much to you. Like, okay, why is having a certain kind of foot and like chewing your food in a certain way, who cares about that? That doesn't do much for me. But that's because you've got a radically different life than the people that wrote this, right? For them, those features coming together were an important constellation, an important integrated unit. And if an animal comes along that doesn't have the, that integration right, such that it fits in their head properly, they didn't like it. It, it was unclean for them. Okay. So Douglas says the following. In general, the underlying principle of cleanness in animals is that they should conform fully to their class. Those specimens are unclean, which are imperfect members of their class, or whose class itself confounds the general scheme of the world. So uh, in uh, this culture, they had basically uh, the world is divided into three. There's the air, there's the water, and there's the earth. And what they liked was when your form of locomotion and the shape of your body and the place that you live all fit together. So uh, if you are uh, living in the water, you should be scaly and you should swim with fins. What's an animal that lives in the water that doesn't have that form of locomotion? A duck, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I think that counts as an air animal. I was thinking more of shellfish, which famously Judaism says you shouldn't eat. You shouldn't eat crabs. Crabs have this, they walk on legs, right? But that's not what you're supposed to do in the water. The water is for things that swim. Walking, jumping, hopping, that's for the earth. So if you're a hopper or a walker and you live on the, on, in the water, your mode of locomotion doesn't integrate properly with your place of living. Yeah? Yeah? Is this just the redefinition of typicality again, though? Like, no? If, if, if they don't conform to these features, then, like, or, or they're, if they're not typical, they're dirty, they're unclean. No, it's not the same as typicality because typicality applied to features, not integrated collections of things. So what's, what's important here is the integration of these things, right? It's the way they hang together. And it's the way that your theory about how things behave on Earth sort of predicts that the features will hang together as an integrated whole. So it's when the, the features aren't integrated properly that people find things uncanny, whereas typicality is a feature by feature fact. Yeah? Yeah? I don't, want to, I don't want to speculate on how these... Be, okay, so this is, this is, I believe it's throughout the Torah that they have this, like, there's the air, the water, and the earth. And probably those categories had important explanatory import for them, like that there's, a, there's major differences between what you can do in the water and what you can do on earth kind of thing. So typically when people have categories, deep, important explanatory categories for themselves, it's because their way of life is diff, like, depends on those, those explanatory categories. Yeah. Does that help? Does that help? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Okay. Sorry. Right, yeah. So just to understand like the integration part of all of this. Yeah. Um, like would, it, would features have to be in like the right places? Like if the wings were on its like a bird's feet, would that be weird under these circumstances? I think that would be weird okay. no matter what happens. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's right. The, yeah, I think that's right. So it's the it's the that they want to find an animal to be clean is that their their features hang together in the right way. Yeah. Are you saying that so the, the conclusion is this is this thing is dirty, right? Yeah. So because of this, these things is dirty. However, um, I've also heard people say that don't eat shellfish or don't eat pork is because they're scavengers. So because of this, you come up with excuses for them being dirty, or is this dirty? Um, I don't think that that's a good explanation, simply because 
they would happily eat other scavengers. So there's, there's bottom feeding fish that they would happily eat. Um, and you're just as likely to get sick from salmonella from chickens as you are from trichinosis from pigs. So like there's, there's food dangers all over the place and there's no real like, it's not obvious that it's just like way healthier to eat this way. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's my, that's my answer. No, my Are they coming up with this excuse that these animals are scavengers because they are thinking of them? Oh, I see what you. Oh, sorry, sorry. I had your I had your question backwards. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the what the psychology of that ex, that ex, explanation is. Yeah, uh, that's a it's a valid. So we very often do that, right? So we say like you find something to be unclean, and then you produce a reason why you find that to be unacceptable. Yeah, interesting. Okay, good. Yeah, nice. I saw your hand as well. So, the, 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 basically, what we don't what we don't like is when features are crossed. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. With an important, uh, like important, I guess, categories and concepts that are like integrated. Yeah. What I would say is, but there seems to be like certain things where that's okay. So, like if you saw like a like a tree with like human teeth. That sounds like really gross, right? Oh, yeah. Right? But if, and so that would, be, that would be a tree. Okay, but what about, like, if you were to make, like, a, like a, uh, if you look at, like, a, a puppy or, like, a cat, they have, like, very large eyes and, and they have, like, a lot of human like features. Mm -hmm. But we're like, that's cute. And it's like, these are good. These are good. But that same crossing is still kind of occurring. I think what that doesn't mess up is important explanatory categories. Oh, so it has so, to be, if it's explanatory, it has to be like... What, okay, so what, what, what's scary is when an animal is made to look too much like a human. So did anybody see the trailer for the new Sonic the Hedgehog movie? <laughs> yeah, it's horrifying. Because they made a basically animal body, but he put a very human face on it, and it's like, ah. Uh, speaking of movies, let's let's bring this to the like modern era a little bit and talk about another thing. So here's another very important explanatory category that you have: human and non-human, alive and not alive. So what they call the uncanny valley is when you have a representation of something that kind of looks like a human face, but doesn't quite look like a human face. This is from Rogue One, and they, they made this, when it's static, this guy looks quite human, but when you see him, he's, he's a CGI, he was from the original Star Wars movie, and then he died, and they put him in this movie with computer animation, and it looks really creepy, because it's kind of alive, but not really. And I hope this is an important explanatory category for you. People and non-people, right? You gotta behave much, much differently towards people than you do to non-people. I hope everybody understands this already. If you were raised properly, then you, you got this very early. You have to treat persons with care and concern and respect, and non-persons can be used to your ends. But is this a person or a non-person? And the uncanny valley is this uncomfortable middle ground between those two. Yeah? Like, don't people, some people argue, like, animated villains aren't scary because they're not as realistic? Sure, sure. Well, no, I, I think that that's, they're not as scary because they're not person-like. So we find people to be very scary, and if they're not like realistically person-like, then they're gonna be, well, he's, he's just not quite realistic enough to trick you. Uh, to, so he, you can tell that he's animated, but he looks very person-like. So it's just like, it's just ruining the, it's, it, it's right between the categories alive and not alive. He is scary, but in the original movies, he's not creepy scary. He's just scary. I think this is much more disturbing. Yeah. Is it part of what's contributing to the uncanny valley here, though, that you know that the actor that played Tarkin here is dead already, and that he's been recreated? This should exist. You've got that mental switch in your head telling you that there's something. Um, that certainly could be a contributing factor in this case. The uncanny valley is certainly not just this guy, though. So a uh, robot face that looks too much like a human. So we like robots, robots are cute, they're fine, no problem with robots. Uh, we like people, people are fine. 
But if something is a robot that looks too much like a human, then suddenly we're like, ugh. So there doesn't need to be that added, like, this is a dead guy aspect. For the Uncanny Valley, it's supposed to be a very general feature, like, you know, if it's too, if it's almost but not quite human, it messes up our explanatory category, this distinction between living and non-living, and then we find it does, unsettling. Does that extend to non-living things? So if I have like a CGI car, for example, a real car, will that? Happen? No, because it doesn't mess up our distinction between person and non-person, right? Okay. Watch it. And something like this. I'm gonna spoil it. It looks real, but it's CGI. Okay. And like, you, when you okay. watch it, it, you're just gonna keep watching and you're like, oh, this is, these are people. No. And then you realize very quickly, or actually after like 10 minutes, no. it's not. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. I, I think it probably doesn't feed into purity codes all that much because uh, what it's not doing, like what, what really disturbs us, what we find unclean is when you've got a, when you've got a set of categories that you need to live. So they kind of take on a, a deep emotional quality to them. If you generated your own category, it's, it's conceivable that it would take on this, this resonance for you, but most of the time, most people are much more kind of like compelled by uh, the categories that you live by rather than the categories that you sort of generate for yourself. That's what I would suggest. It's the, it's the categories that you kind of inhabit almost unconsciously that we get defensive about, that we, that we find it disturbing when they're violated. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Maybe one way of thinking about this is, so if you recall Douglas's distinction between, uh, like sometimes when, when something messes up our category, we find it disgusting. Sometimes we find it sacred. So like, uh, it's the, the category of the sacred is hard to talk about because it's like, it's not like happy and fun. The sacred is not, nice necessarily, but it's very compelling uh, and it's got its own kind of creepiness to it. So like maybe Superman gets to be sacred in some sense. Uh, I don't know. I don't really, I don't really have a great response. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So for like Uncanny Valley, if I have a human actor, but that's playing a robot, they will take Arnold Schwarzenegger as a Terminator. Uh -huh. Person or that he does I've never heard anybody describe that as uncanny or in the uncanny valley because he is a person. Okay, so here's let me let me broaden this a little bit. So think about horror movies. How do you make a scary horror movie character? One way is to make something that is both alive and not alive. So zombies are like this. Zombies violate the category of alive things and not alive things. One of the important things about alive things is they move. Not alive things, generally speaking, just stay put. But zombies are not alive, but they move. Gah. Horrifying, right? So think about the, the movie monsters and you'll probably think about, you'll probably uh, like, so ghosts again, again, live, not alive. Vampires, they're alive, but not alive, right? These all mess up these that crucial explanatory category, being alive or not being alive. Okay. So that, you know, let's, let's draw back. Where were we? Basically, all of that was a long extended case study. Remember we're in a COGSI class? Everybody recall that? 
Okay, so we're doing CogSci. We're trying to figure out categorization still. Uh, so remember this. So uh, the whole point of that, we did that extended thing about uh, Mary Douglas and uh, her analysis of purity codes because it's supposed to be a kind of nice way of thinking about a nice case study for the micro theory of concepts, which says that your concepts are predictive theories. Right? That's, that was the basic point of that. So you got these theories that you use to try to make predictions about the world. I'm trying to predict whether that object is gonna move on its own or stay put. And if it moves on its own when I think it's gonna stay put, I'm upset, I don't like that. I'm gonna try to predict what kind of method of locomotion an animal is gonna have based on whether it's in the, uh, in the air or the water or on the earth. And if something messes that up, I don't like it. All of this, so Douglas's theory was actually was written before the micro theory came out. So she wasn't trying to prove that the micro theory is true, just to be clear on that. But her whole analysis of purity codes feeds really nicely into the micro theory. So what we're doing when we're categorizing is actually building predictive explanatory theories to try to understand our world. And we understandably get frustrated when the world refuses to comport with our theories, right? So when, you're, when you've got a concept that is crucial to your way of making it through the world and something wrecks the concept, right? It's not, it's not following the prediction, the explanatory predictions that your concept was providing you with, you find that disturbing and you try to reconcile that somehow. That's the, that's the hook back into micro theory, yeah? Okay, so that's not a proof of micro theory. There's probably other theories of concepts that could fit with, uh, with this uh, purity code stuff, but it is a really nice example. And it's a nice example in a way that most of the examples we've had so far aren't nice examples because uh, people do weird things in a psychology lab. And this study, uh, Douglas's Purity and Danger, comes from like, real people living their actual lives over very long periods and across very large geographic regions. So she's got a much larger sample that's much less artificial than the kind of things you get out of a psychology lab. So that's nice. Okay, so those are some stuff about micro theories. And of course I can't just say that this is a correct theory. I have to, I have to cause problems for it. And the problem is homunculi, the homunculi. So how is it that you come up with theories of the world? What's a theory? It's, a, it's an intelligent guess about what's gonna happen. It's an intelligent guess to try to understand the world, but that means that we put understanding at the root of categorization, and understanding is a very intelligent thing that you do. So we dug down into categories and found theories. Theories require intelligence to develop and to use. So, shoot. Um, again, so just to make this not disastrous, that none of that is to say that the micro theory is wrong. Okay, so we, I think we've genuinely gained something by looking at it, by trying to understand it, I think we genuinely made progress over the prototype theory by thinking about concepts as theories. We've uncovered some of their rich internal conceptual, like their internal structure. What we found was they, we need to talk about the structure of concepts in order to understand like how they work. But what we've once again found is that we need intelligence to explain intelligence. We've kind of, we've kind of gone in a loop again. Uh, yeah, so what do we do? Well, here are some options. Uh, we could try to fix up one of these theories. We would try a different analytical probe, so switch from categorization to memory, which is what we're gonna do next week. We could give up, and we could cry. We could try some combination of all of those things. This, doesn't, this is not mutually exclusive. Don't feel that you have to pick just one. Uh, but those are the options on the table. For now, our, in class, the plan is gonna be to do number two. Uh, that is, we're gonna shift next class from 
thinking about categorization. So we were like, maybe categorization is the basic thing. We're going to shift next class to memory, and then the class after that to problem solving, and see if we can get any further. OK? And it's, it's OK to cry. OK. <laughs> OK, so that's it for today. We'll see you on Tuesday.